Numbers chapter 13. Context here, the children of Israel has had traversed the wilderness and they're finally in front, just a few miles away from the promised land, the land that God had promised to give to them. Verse 21 says this, So they went up and spied the land. Moses sent 12 spies to check out the land, make sure it is everything God said it was going to be. Verse 23, Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them in a pole. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. These graves were really big. It took two men to carry them. Verse 25 said, And then they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. 26 says, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and they showed them the fruits of the land. 27, Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. Everybody say, it flows flows. with milk and honey. honey. Everybody said, the promise promise. is exactly exactly like God said it would be. be. Now turn to the one you like, the one on your left. Probably that's the one you like. The neighbor that you like. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, come and see, come and see. Now, to talk to the, the other person which you claim to like. We know, we all know the truth. And tell them, come and see, come and see. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the brilliance of your presence, the power of your person. We are not here by the routine of religion. We are here to seek your face as we hear your word. Let it break every resistance. And make us better people. Better examples of your glory. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have your seat. You can have. Let's put our hands together and celebrate our worship team, if you don't mind. That's what you do. And while we're doing that, let's celebrate our dream team. Our dream team. Our dream team is so special. I actually saw one of them. They came back from work. They literally came from work this morning and came to serve on a Sunday morning. So when you see any of them, just say thank you. Thank you for helping me park my car, taking care of my kids. I know how unruly they are. Thank you. (laughs) How many of you here have seen um, one of those um, films um, that they tell the story from different perspectives? perspectives like you tell it from one perspective you get to somewhere and then you don't worry Ryan then they change the camera angle and then tell it from another perspective um, I think to do the story in numbers 13 justice we have to examine it from different perspectives because there were different kinds of people waiting to get into the promised land so it will do us justice to look at that. The first person's perspective we'll consider is Moses. Moses is born into chaos. The children of Israel are now slaves in Egypt. And the Bible says he's born during that time. What began as a sweet story of a family reunion between Joseph, his parents, his b- 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 brothers, quickly declined into slavery. And it was this, this, this condition that Moses was born into. And their life was not just difficult at the moment. Their future was being threatened because Pharaoh had issued a command that every male child should be killed. So every boy that was born could have died. Now, thank God for the divine disobedience of the, hand, the maidens, the, 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 the handsmaids, the people who were helping to deliver the child because when the child was born and Pharaoh realized there are still more boys being born, called them together, what is happening? Aren't you killing them? I told you to kill them if you find out it's a boy. The Bible says that these women said, the Hebrew women gave birth faster than we could come. They lied. I know most of you who have given birth and you're praying the prayer of the Hebrew woman. (laughs) 
Let me bust your bubble. I'm glad the word of God inspired faith. But the accuracy of the word of God was that those people were lying when they said what they said. They were giving Pharaoh an excuse for why they preserved the lives. So the Hebrew women didn't really give birth very fast. They were just, it was I that, I'm sorry. Most of you are like, which kind of church is this? That's the Bible. That's what the Bible says that they lied to him and they told him that. But that was a divine intervention that preserved the life of kids like this boy. Moses was born into this darkness, into this chaos, this depressive state. In the middle of this darkness, while the people were in pain, God was working on a plan. Working on a plan to save them. God introduced a boy into the equation that was preserved by the same institution that was trying to kill him. The Bible says he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, the man who gave the command for him to be killed. God is funny like that. God will drive you into your enemy's space and preserve you there. Psalm 23, he prepares a table for you in the presence. And there is no table without seats. There are no table and seats without a house. So in, in essence, God prepares a house for you in enemy territory to prove to you, how will you know he's a deliverer and a protector if there is nothing to protect you from? So it's into this world of death threats and darkness that Moses is born. Moses is a deliverer. He's the answer to God's, the cry of God's people. He's born a prince. He's born a Hebrew, but he grows up a prince of Egypt. Um, and one day he makes a mistake. And on this day, we have a window into the tension of his life. He's born a Hebrew, but he's raised as an Egyptian. So you see the tension on the inside of him. And one day he makes a mistake that reveals this tension. He sees an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew person. And then he kills the Egyptian in trying to protect the Hebrew person. The word goes out. And even the Hebrews turn against him. And Pharaoh hears about it. And Moses runs away because he does not want to be killed. The Bible goes on to say in Exodus chapter 2 that he settles for a regular life with a wife and his son and some sheep regular life. It was during this regular routine of his life, um, during one of his trips back from um, giving the ship some food, the, the graves, and they were on the way back, he saw this burning bush that was not being consumed. He turns around, he meets God there, has an encounter with God that activates his call. God tells him, I've called you. I'm going to give you another chance at doing what I created you to do. I know you blew it, but I'm too glad you serve a God that will give you another chance even after you've made a mistake. You made a mistake in the last relationship, but that does not make you second best. God says, I still have a best plan for you. Aren't you glad you have a God who will give you another chance to try again? Bible says he tries again and he's ordained his call. He accepts the call under some terms though. And finally, after much persuasion, he goes back to the, to, to, to the elders of Israel and tells them, God has sent me to deliver you. I am the answer to your prayers. I'm the person you've been praying for. They find it difficult to believe, but it's okay. Finally, they believe, they support him to, to, to represent them before, before, before Pharaoh. And through some miraculous acts of God, finally, God frees the people. But this is where the work begins for him because the children of Israel proved to be some of the most difficult and disgruntled people to lead. They complained every time. Complained about water, complained about food. They wanted onions and leeks. Where are you going to find onions in the wilderness? They were complaining about five course meals we had in Egypt. One time they actually threatened to get a leader to go back. Like, we're done. We're not following you anymore. Find somebody to take us back. We're not doing it again. I don't want to be delivered. I want to be a slave. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that anybody says thank you to this man. He left his family, left his family with his in-laws. Every man knows what it feels like when your father-in-law has custody of your kids. And they say you're irresponsible because you're pursuing the call of God in your life. <laughs> when, when I married you off, you were supposed to be taking care of her. All the sacrifices, anytime he went in to see Pharaoh, he could have died. He could have been killed. 
Nobody says thank you. But that's not the problem. The, 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 the concern today is that they're finally a few miles away from the promised land. Finally, all the work, all the leadership progress, all the, all the things they had to do, they did, victories they won, and finally, they're there. He, he likes the idea of sending in spies. They send out 12 people in there, and they say, go in there, find out how the land is. They send out, they come back, and they say, the land is exactly like God said it was going to be. Mission accomplished. Point number one, God has made a way. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but in temptation will also make a way of escape. I wish that verse ended so that you can run away. He said, no, so that you may be able to bear it. Most of us are looking for ways of escape to leave. God is saying, no, probably a way of escape to stay. Because it's in the staying that you're formed. The Bible says God provides a, provides a way of escape. God has made a way. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 verse 15, don't forget that he, God, led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with the poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was very hot and dry. He gave you water from a rock. God has made a way out of it. God made a way through the Red Sea. God made a way to give water and food to this multitude of people. God made a way to call water from a rock. God made a way through this terrifying fine wilderness. God made the way to the promise. And now they're standing merely miles away from the promise. God had brought them through everything. And you could see the smile on Moses' face when he realized what God said God has done. Yeah. Then we almost rewind, 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 and then we look at the perspective <laughs> of the spies. <laughs> The perspective of the spies, they have a similar um, upbringing from with M M M M Moses, or at least their dads did. The same difficulty, but theirs was punctuated with a cry for help. Their hard labor was punctuated with a cry for help. They cried for help and they saw no sign that God, sorry, that God was hearing them until this man appears on the scene. This man is an 80-year-old man, and in his age, we realize that when we were crying for 80 years, God has been working on a plan that we did not see. Because God is not one of those chefs that cooks in front of you to impress you with his skills. God just appears with the dish. It is up to us to trust that the chef is cooking even if we cannot see him. Doesn't the song, the song say, even when I don't feel him, he's working. Even when I don't see it, he's working. He never stops working. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. That's what he is. So God doesn't need to impress you with his activity. This man appears on the scene, but the appearance of this man triggers mixed emotions because um, the, the kids don't know who he is, but their fathers tell him that this is Moses. This is the guy that ran away, that killed the Egyptian and ran away. Thank God Pharaoh did not take out his anger on us when he ran away, but he ran away at the first sign of difficulty. Now you're saying God sent you to be our deliverer. What's going to happen when it becomes hard? Will you run away again? So yes, I hear you. You want to be a deliverer. God has sent you, but the last time you were here and you you tried to deliver just the one person you ran away and now you said God has called you to deliver the nation what's going to happen when it becomes hard so while they had the mixing they had that part they also had the part of rejoicing because finally there is proof that God heard them there is proof that this man was sent by God. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 4 verse 30, and Aaron spoke the words that the Lord had given to Moses and then he did the signs. Moses did not just come with words. Moses came with signs. Verse 31 says, so the people believed. By much persuasion and demonstration, they believe that this man was sent to be their deliverer. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that he, but he looked upon their affliction, the Bible says they bowed their heads and worshipped. You can imagine how beautiful it was. Finally, God has come true. Somebody to lead us in battle. Somebody to lead us in conquest against the Egyptians. But their joy was quickly extinguished because the very first conversation their deliverer had with Pharaoh made things worse. If you read the story, the, the Egyptians had been giving them the raw materials to build with. But all of a sudden, 
Pharaoh said, you have time on your hands because you're, you're, you're being creative. You want to leave. Let me, I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to take away the raw materials. You go find your own raw materials and you still have to build exactly at the same pace that you were building when we were giving you the raw materials. So you can imagine Moses is coming back like, um, so we went there, you know what I mean? Did some of the things we did. Um, the update now is we're going to have to um, source our own materials. And what was once joy gave way to despair. Hope gave way to anger. Worship gave way to complaints. This was supposed to be God's man. I thought you said God sent you. We believed actually and we worship this God. We believe God had begun the deliverance. What do you do? When you're sure God has answered, but things then get worse. What do you do when you're sure the promotion is your boss actually told you on Thursday they were considering you, you're the top candidate, you're going to get it. On Monday you get an email, your department is being shut down. What do you do when it is that it's as if the breakthrough is there? I'm sure God said that, but the lump is growing, but the pain is increasing, but I cannot use my level. What do you do? When you have to wrestle with the tension of, I thought God said so, but Pharaoh is saying something different. And it seems for now that Pharaoh is winning. The brilliance of God is that while we are thinking of escape, God is thinking of total annihilation. While you just want to escape the one thing, God is saying, I want to destroy them so that you never have to deal with them again. While you are thinking about having just one child, God is saying, I want to get you in a place where you can have triplets if that's what you want. Most of you are like, I'm Pastor Vic, no. You will not. I reject. I reject. I reject. <laughs> it's interesting how our priorities are different from God. He says, my ways are not your ways. Because you just want out. I want to make sure that they never come for you again. So, God begins to show off. The Bible says, first of all, Aaron's rod turns into a snake, swallows up the snakes of the old. The magicians then denial turns to blood. Then God goes for lies and flies everywhere. Then the animals get sick. Then boils break out on everybody's body and, 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 and hail and locust and darkness. And God is not even done yet. While all of this is happening, the children of Israel are in Goshen, enjoying themselves. There's darkness here. There's light here. That's why before the service ends, we remind ourselves that we are Goshen. What does that mean? My reality is different. I might walk in the same office as you, share the same desk as you, but my reality is different. The rules that govern my life are different than yours. What might cause pain for you, yet you might think it's causing pain for what God is working through is an excellent work. Everybody say, I am Goshen. That's why we say that. God was not done with the darkness. The Bible actually goes on to say that on this night, at midnight, God killed every firstborn in Egypt. While the children of Israel are eating, the angel of death is killing. The Bible says Pharaoh lost his firstborn up until people who were in prison, people who were in prison lost their firstborn outside. Dogs were losing their firstborn. Cats, cattle, pigs, all kinds of things. Losing as long as you were firstborn and you were not covered under the canopy of God's protection, you lost, you, you, you died. And the Bible goes on to say in Exodus chapter 12, verse 29, it came to pass that at midnight the Lord struck all the firstborns in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborns of livestock. So Pharaoh rose at night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up. This is the same man that was like, you're not going anywhere. He says, rise up, 
Go out from among the people, both you and the children of Israel. Go and serve the Lord as you said. Take your flock, take your animals, take your dogs, take your herds as you have said. Be gone, and I like this little phrase here, and bless me. Just pray for me because it's going to be difficult to lead these people. They've just lost all, their, their kids are dead. Say a prayer for me. How does a man who was the orchestrator of the punishment of a nation turn around and ask for prayer. Yeah. It's the same way God wants to use you to reach that irritation in your office that calls themselves your boss. Jesus. Or you have sabotaged God's plan because of your face and your attitude. Yes, they annoyed you, but you were supposed to have joy in that storm. And all of a sudden they realize that your reality is different from theirs. And they come to you one day and be like, man, I've seen that you have joy. Can you pray for me to have what you have? But because of your face and your attitude, you replied that email with, as stated in my last email. <laughs> That's passive aggression. <laughs> Bible says, he said, bless me. Verse 33, and the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. There are things God is going to deliver you from in haste, but not without verse 36. The Lord had given the people favor in the sight of Egypt so that they granted them what they requested. God had told them, go to your neighbors, get gold, silver, get their precious things. Before You're not going to live empty-handed. Again, while you are just thinking of escaping as you are, God is saying, no, I don't want to just escape. I want you to live with gold. Live better than you came. Live richer than you came. Live stronger than you came. This is not just about escaping. This is about becoming a nation. A nation needs some resources. They are chased out of Egypt. And everything is going well. Everything is looking good. Finally, they are free. And then a grumble begins to roll down from the front because those in front had met a sea, the Red Sea. And they realized there's no way forward. Where is Moses? Where is Moses? Where are we going? Where are we going? You know what? Why did we even come here? We need to go back there. At least we're eating onions. I, I don't know why they were in. If you read the Bible, a lot of onions. They really loved onions there. I don't know. I don't like onions, except it's like leeks. Who cares? You know what I mean? That's anyway, onions, Moses. <laughs> Very soon, the complaints reach the back. Then we see them complaining about the very first obstacle, and they forget the same God who delivered them is there with them. The same God who made a way out of Egypt has also can make a way from this. God in his mercy, in spite of their, of their complaints, makes a way through the wilderness. And that's just the start of miraculous things he does. The Bible says he calls them manna to feed them from the sky. Winds blew in meat for them. He gave them water from a rock. I like how God flexes sometimes. He could have made a stream, you know what I mean? Just come true. That's more, makes sense, logical. You know what I mean, stream, oh yeah, yeah. God looks for the hardest way possible. So how do, we, how do we give them water? And Jamaica was like, um, there's a stream close by, we can just re rechannel it. Nah, there's a rock. <laughs> Angels are like, it's, we're trying to give them water, not, <laughs> not stones. And they say, no, there's a rock. Tell Moses to, to talk to the rock. Moses is like, this is going to look really foolish. Go there, just talk, talk to the rock. God looks for, we call God the God of impossibilities. But when he begin to, begins to act like a God of impossibilities, we complain because it doesn't look logical. The way I expected you to act is not the way you're acting. How I expected you to bring the water is not the way you're bringing the water. So I have a problem and we sabotage the process of God because God did not bring a stream when we needed water. He highlighted a rock, a difficult place. God is incredible and he does these incredible things and finally they are standing there. They send out the spies, the spies come back after 40 days and say exactly what God told Moses in Exodus 3 verse 8. I'm sending them to a land that flows with milk and honey. They say truly this land flows with milk and honey. They come back with grapes so huge that two people had to carry it. They come back and there's news now. This is no more 
his story. This is actually real life. The promised land is just miles away. The spies are excited because they were sent there, because they were given the honor of seeing it for the very first time. They come back and they tell their neighbors, they tell their friends what God said he was going to do. He has done it. And here is proof of what he has done. This is no more just a story. This is lived. I, I'm telling you, this. I've already found my house there. It's going to be incredible. I got your own just beside my own. This is amazing. God is faithful. We stop there and then we'll rewind. I will look at the perspective of one of the people in the camp that was not a spy. Again, the story sound, sounds the same. They are born, or their fathers are born into the period where the, the, the boys are being killed. And by some miracle and intervention of God, their lives are preserved. Everything seems the same. The sorrow is the same. The pain is the same. The despair is the same. The hopelessness is the same. The, 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 the difficulty, the challenge. Egypt is the same. The experience is the same until the spies are sent to Egypt. And those 40 days differentiate 12 people from hundreds of thousands of people. The Bible says in those 40 days, there is a differentiation. 12 men walk into an experience that changes their lives forever. 12 men have an encounter that changes their lives forever. They walk into joy. They walk into peace. They walk into purpose. They walk into destiny. They spent time experiencing something nobody in the camp could say they have ever experienced the bible actually says they spend more than one month in the promised land eating in the promised land drinking water of the promised land no more do i have to rely on a rock i can just go to the tap open the tap you know what i mean dancing in the, in the square they went to shop bought some little gifts trinkets little things for their they had gold remember so just little, just living life. Wake up, looking at the sun. Those things are just nice, wind, fresh breeze is blowing. That's great. You know what I mean? Look at the houses. They're arguing, no, that's going to be my house. That's not going to be your house. No, you're going to stay there. I saw this finder's keeper. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and for 40 days, they experience what nobody in the camp. So it's almost as if the, 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 the screen splits. And while one person is wondering when this pain is going to end, living in the anxiety that Pharaoh might have mustered up another army, mm-hmm. might be coming for them. One person is eating lunch in the market square, just enjoying themselves. While one person is anxious and looking in the horizon to see when people are coming back, this other ones are sleeping and snoring because it's just day 18. They don't care about coming back. The realities are so starkly different that you can imagine the joy when the silhouettes of these spies broke the horizon. I could just imagine kids were playing in the outskirts of the camp and then they see these men coming and they scream, they're back! They're back, they're back! And everybody gathers! Everybody surrounds them, trying to look at their faces to see the expression that could give a hint to what it was like there. People are trying to read their faces. Was it nice? What do you think? Was it? They're just trying to see. All of a sudden, somebody that had a six pack now has one keg. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it must be good. Because you, Simeon, did not have a keg. Now you have a keg. And Simeon is there. Like, yeah, this is really good. <laughs> and I could see the joy and those boys say the magical words. It truly looks like what God has said. It truly is like what God has said. You can imagine their joy when they realize what they have been waiting for, what they have been fighting for, what they had journeyed throughout all the wilderness. It looks like God has made a way. God has brought them finally to the fulfillment. This is no longer a story. This is real life. And there are people who have experienced it. This is not a tale anymore. This is real life. But it's at this junction. It's at this, almost like if I take a screenshot of this celebration of the spies, of Moses, and of the rest of the camp, that that I begin to have a problem with the entire story. Because in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17, let me show you what I think the problem is. Moses sent, sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, verse 18, see what the land is like. 
19, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad. 20, and bring some of the fruit of the land. The Bible is very clear to state that now was the time of the season of the first ripe grapes. 23 says, and then they came to the valley of Eshkol and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. And these grapes were so big, two of them had to carry it on a pole. It's not like the grapes we buy from, we're online so I can't say any store. <laughs> from one of these stores. The farmer's market has nothing on these grapes. One cluster, not one branch. They cut one cluster from one branch and it was so big that two men who are strong enough to defend themselves, if you're spying out a land, you're deciding that you might die. If you get caught, you might be killed. So you have to be strong enough to defend yourself. These were not regular men. These were strong men. It took two of them to carry one cluster of grapes. The grapes were so big, the Bible says in verse 24, that the valley was called the valley of Eshkol because of the kind of grapes they found there. That word Eshkol means cluster. It's actually believed that that valley is still there and it's still a very rich supply of grapes. So let's distill what we have here. We have a region known for grapes during a time of ripe grapes. The grapes are so big that it takes two men to carry one cluster of grapes. And there are 12 men who can form six pairs. This is my question. Why are two people carrying what all 12 men should be carrying? Why are two people doing what all 12 of them should be doing? Why did 12 people experience the faithfulness of God and two people come back with proof? Why did 12 people eat and wine and dine and fill their bellies with the goodness of God and only had the capacity for two? Why did two people do what 12 people should be doing? Why are we over 750 in attendance every week and only two people invite people to church? In case you were wondering, in this story, we are the spies. We are the ones that have tasted of God's goodness. We are the ones that have spent time in God's presence. We are the ones who have filled our bellies with the goodness of God. We are the ones who have been in his presence. We are the ones who have gone to the promised land and have seen for ourselves how good God is. But only two of us do is coming back We proof of the goodness of God. 12 of us, all of us, Psalm 34 verse 8, have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We've tasted that God is faithful. We, we've, we've enjoyed his healing. We've walked around in the goodness of God. We've filled our lives with the goodness of God. We know Jesus. We love Jesus. On Sunday, we come into his presence and we are healed. We are restored. We are motivated. But then we leave on Sunday and go back home like nothing happened. Like one of the spies that just stuffed their mouth with the grapes just before they got to the camp and then they're cleaning their mouths because they don't want to show what they have experienced. We are the ones that read our Bibles in, in the morning and we get some hope. We get some life in the scripture. And then we're on the Zoom call and you can see that your co-worker is suffering. You can see they're holding back tears. Something must be happening. And then we wipe our mouths like nothing has happened. Like we've not experienced hope. That we've not experienced joy. That we don't know how to find peace. And we cannot refer them to where we found peace. How is it that 12 men went and enjoyed it for 40 days? And only two of them came back with proof. Those, that number is significant because when you read the rest of the story, two men carried grapes, John. Two men said, everybody should come, let's go now. Yeah. Ten men did not carry grapes. Ten men said, we should not go now. Yeah. Yeah. So the number of people that carried grapes is the same number of people that invited other people to join them yeah. to experience what they experienced. The number that did not carry grape is the same number of people that dissuaded people from enjoying what they themselves had enjoyed. How selfish are we that we have tasted of the goodness of God and we pretend like nothing happened. We pretend like our lives have not been changed. We go to work like nothing happened. Get on a social media like nothing happened. You watch the message on Tuesday, it blesses you again and, and, and then you, pray, you, you pretend like nothing happened. You pray and God heals you and you pretend like nothing happened. We pray and God does something. 
then you realize it's not how big a church is numerically. It's the number of people in the church that are willing to invite other people to experience what they've experienced. God doesn't judge by the number of spies that went to Canaan to spy. He judges by the number of people that came to get others to go with them. Then we begin to learn very quickly, point number two, that our capacity determines their experience. And by there, I mean those people who have not met Jesus yet. Our capacity to share our experience with them. Our capacity to point them in the direction of where we found hope. Our capacity to point them in the direction of where we find, found peace. I'm not saying become an evangelist overnight. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the best you can do is do what you, what you do when you go to a restaurant and you like the food. You take a picture of the food or sometimes yourself with the food or you give your phone to the person you're eating with and then you, you smile and you take a picture and then you post it for thousands of people to say, hey, and then you tag the restaurant. I ate here. What am I? Why did I? I'm asking you to do what you already do. Somehow we excuse it when it comes. I don't want to offend people. But you sent the picture of a stick to somebody who might have decided the night before they're not going to eat meat again. Did you care? Did you care they've made the decision not to eat meat again? That you're being offensive? When you posted that you're on vacation in Bali, did you care about those who are too broke to go to... to, 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 to Shut up. <laughs> you don't care about those things. But when it comes to sharing where you find hope from, Jesus. you don't want to be offensive. When did hope become offensive? When did peace become offensive? When did joy and life become offensive? When did healing and restoration become offensive? When did we become too sensitive to offense? If you are false, carry grapes. Few people would taste the grapes because what is one cluster of grapes going to do for hundreds of thousands of people? If few of us say something, only few of them get to hear about Jesus and his church. The mindset we must have is point number three no one else is coming. Read that story, no one else came. There was not another group. That came with many grapes, enough for everybody. There was not another group coming to persuade them to come along with them. That's it. We are God's plan. Plan. No, yeah. There is no plan B. We are the plan. The church is the plan in Rockville. The church is the plan in Montgomery County. The church is the plan in the United States. The church is the plan in the world. Wherever you are watching the church, you Individually and collectively, we are God's plan to reach people. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I think, 5 verse 11, it says, because we understand the fearful responsibility to the Lord, we walk hard. Pastor Victor, I'm shy. Pastor Victor, I've never done this before. Pastor Victor, like, I don't, I don't talk to people. Da, 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 da. He said, no, we walk hard. We're going to have to push past our preferences. Yeah. Do you think God did not know he created you shy? Oh, I'm an introvert. We don't, we don't do that as an introvert. You, you think God did not know he created an introvert? Let's not go into the psychology and the spiritual part of it. But even if you're an introvert, you think God does not know? Did he say that we understand our responsibility? This is for the introverts. We work for the extroverts. We work hard while we do it for the introverts to not do it. No, he doesn't care. See, we work hard to persuade others. God knows that we are sincere and we and, and hope you know that too. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And he has given us this wonderful ministry. One translation says this wonderful assignment of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Bringing two parties together. That's all he's asking you to do. Bring two parties together. Go out during the week and bring somebody together with your son. Even if you don't come with them, tell them, hey, come. God loves you. 
There is this church that is wonderful. If you don't have the boldness yet for the God loves you part, you can make it in the church. It's a wonderful church. They are cool. The pastor seems to be cool. The wife is really, really cute and she's powerful. She's smart. She's really demanding. The guy just hangs around for... I was trying to say is that we are God's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. As I, as I read this, I was reminded of a story, not a story, a real life event that happened on Sunday. I don't know if the, the, that's, that household is here. There was a family that came to church for the very first time on Sunday. Last Sunday, I told you, God is so interested in connecting with people that he will walk into spaces. Jesus was walking to a room where his life was threatened. God is so desperate. Jesus was so desperate to connect with people. He would invite himself to their homes. Revelation 3 says, God stands at the door and knocks. There's a family that was here last week. I like to know how, when I see people that come for the very first time, how did you hear about the well? And they told an incredible story. The wife was like, um, so this morning, I, I woke up this morning. I don't, I don't know where she was in there. I think in the kitchen or something, doing something. And something in her, she just heard in her heart, go to the well. Now, they had just moved to the area looking for a church. When she heard that on a Sunday morning, she was like, that's not a church. Now, then, to which I told God, you need to be adding the church to the name. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can't just say go to the well. I know we say the well. When you are talking, please add church. So people know. <laughs> she says, she hears go to the well. She dismisses it because it's not a church. And she's about to do some things. I think feed the kids or something. She hears again, don't forget to go to the well church, I think church, thank God, Jesus church then. She asked her husband, have you heard about the well, the well church? No, they go, pull up their laptop, they type the well church, hit enter. Websites, they go on, oh wow, this is a church. Hey kids, everybody, we are going to church today. And they came to church on a Sunday, I was saying that God is so desperate to connect with people, he will invite himself. When God could not find a human being yeah. to yeah. invite this family, yeah. Yeah. he did the yeah. invitation himself. Yeah. 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 That's how desperate. So how can we hoard a God who is that desperate to meet people? Yeah. Now, he gives us the privilege to be participants in the process because in sharing that story, in sharing our story, in inviting them, we also get the rewards of being about what he's about. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to do what the woman in John chapter 4 did. She comes to the well to get some water. That's where we get our name from. Has this encounter with Jesus. Meets Jesus. She's not planning to meet Jesus. Meets Jesus at the well. Has this incredible conversation that changed her life. What she did not do after that conversation was go back and pretend like nothing happened. Holding her jar. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah. She didn't go back to the office after lunch, after crying in God's presence during the lunch time. God, you're, you're here. You have to like redo your whole the fine art you did on your face. <laughs> had to redo all of that on, on the chemicals. I put in there to like reapply. <laughs> I'm still your friend. And then we wipe our face and get on the Zoom call. Like that did not happen. Like you were not about to lose your mind and then you found strength in God's presence. Then you see a co-worker who you know might need what you have and we pretend like that. That's not what she did. She ran back to the community and said three words God is asking you to say. If you can just learn God three words. She said, John chapter 4, come and see. I don't know how to preach like he preached. I can't articulate the theology like he did. He talked about worship and all kinds of things. I don't know how to do it. All I know how to do is what I'm doing now. Come and see. Come and see a man who has changed my life. Come and see a place I found joy. It's a school, but they somehow turned that school into a place that can house the presence of God. I don't know how they do it, but they do that every week. I know you're going to see a school sign there. You're watching online. It's the same YouTube where you get all kinds of ratchet stuff. Yes, the very same YouTube. 
I know right beside our screen might be something inappropriate to the right. I don't know, wherever that place is. The same YouTube, the same halls, you can find hope. You can find joy. And our job is just to say three words. Come 